We were on our series sermon, really, but today I want to just insert, um, just bonus, just gift, <laughs> about the cross. Um, to preach about the cross, I love to start in this way. Um, I have done before. One of the tasks that companies work very hard is to come up with a memorable and compelling logo. And those real images represent a company's identity and communicate what we are doing. Um, here's our brand. This is who we are. And we know some of the most successful ones throughout the world. So everyone knows what that is. You will show us a picture. This one is Nike. It's called Sush, meaning success. The word Nike originally came from Greek word, which means victory. So the idea is, whenever we look at this logo, we will think of, they want, they want us to think it will help us to be successful. Something like this. So we've got to have the Michael Jordan shoes and everything. So, all right? You will be healthier. And here's the second one. If you look at that one, um, what that is? It's not grocery store, but it's the company of technology. What does that logo mean? That represents knowledge. Knowledge. Like Steve Jobs, you will have a lot of knowledge from this one. You will be smarter with that product that they make. So you've got to get it. iPod, iPad, MacBook, something like that. I also have this one, but I'm, I'm not sure I, I'm smarter than before. <laughs> you know, you will love this one. We are really proud of that one in Savannah. What is that? <laughs> McDonald's, right? When I meet uh, my friends pastors, I always brag, we have McDonald's here. <laughs> what does that stand for? It is joy. Happy meals, right? Pleasure, something like that. With McDonald's, you will be happier than before, right? I don't know. <laughs> anyway, they want us to be joyful. Pleasure with happy meals, all right? Rogos, we all know about that. But, you know, companies pay millions of dollars for people to sit around and develop these things to make them as positive and fun and memorable and compelling as possible. And the goal is to make people say, I want it. I want success. I want victory. I want knowledge. I want joy. I want pleasure. Whatever they offer, I get it. Something like that. But today, today, we are going to talk about the most famous logo in the history of the human race. Think about the church. There's one symbol across time. See it on church, see it on the tombstone in the cemetery, see it on t-shirts, see it on jewelry, see it on your necklace. Everybody understand what that image is? Cross. We start the Lent season, so we have the huge cross here. This is the heart of church. Why? Because it is so common, you can't go anywhere without seeing it multiple times a day. Wherever you go, you will find, you will see cross all over the cities, all over the world. But have you ever thought about this? Where this image originally came from? What does it mean? Surprisingly, this was initially a means of execution, a way to kill people like this. That's why Jesus was killed. Jesus was executed on the cross. The, it was, the cross was the means of execution. It had been developed by Persians, but the Romans actually perfected it, took it, and really used it as a means of deterrence, putting down political rebellion. It was intended to be so not only incredibly painful, but also humiliating because it was for public execution. Everybody could see that and gave up rebellion against government and Roman emperor. They used it that way. And surprisingly, this is the image that came to the church. Now, I want you to think about this again. How strange this is if you want to start your new business and you are thinking about a positive and compelling logo to attract people to your company, to your store, what would you choose from those four options from next screen? What would you choose from this one? 
I believe nobody would choose the cross because it means execution, death. No one wants execution in their lives. But when the early Christians were trying to start a church, surviving under persecutions, very interesting. The symbol they chose to attract people to the church to become a part of the church, part of the faith community, was not a symbol that represents success or joy or pleasure or happy meals or something like that. But what they chose was the symbol of execution. The cross representing scandal, pharaoh, death, humiliation, something like that. Why? Why on earth do they choose that? Who's going to come to the church? Who's going to rally around that? Who thought that it was a good idea? We know what the Bible says about our God. He's a creator. He's a redeemer. He's our father, judge, comforter, and guide, preserver. But today, we come to the one word that is the most serious, most surprising, and most unique word that expresses the God of the Bible. He is the God who sacrificed himself. Who sacrificed himself, God self, to save his word, to save his people, and to save sinners like me and you. There have never been any other God that sacrificed themselves for saving the creatures. We can find. And the symbol of death revealed on the cross shows the sacrificial love of God. This is the beginning of the church. That's why we have the cross on there, on the top of the roof, and you have in your neck, and you have a lot of items of wooden cross at your home. And here's what I'm going to do in this message. How the cross that had been a means of execution, death, came to work to forgive our sin, to save our lives. How this cross could save our lives? That's my question. You know the reason why I started the series sermon, really. It is to make sense our doctrine, our faith. I wanted to find the reason why we believe God, how to make this sense to non-believers out of the building of the church. A lot of people are in Savannah area, a lot of people who don't believe God yet, out of the world. And I wanted to show them this is the reason why we believe God. And this is one of them. Why it is powerful to save us, if you are an unbeliever, you will be doubting. What are you talking about? This cross will save you? This cross will lead you to the heaven? No way. Don't say about that. So today, I wanted to, I wanted to explain, define what, how the cross worked to forgive and save our lives. And why it must be the sole symbol that represents the church and reflects our faith. Because... This is very, very unique and profound way devised by God. And to talk about it, we have to go way back to the story of the book of Genesis. You know, Abraham, the father of faith, God wanted to teach the human race about the nature of his sacrificial love, and he chose one named Abraham, a man named Abraham, and formed a covenant with him. This And this covenant is going to be a real important word for understanding the nature of God and the cross. Covenant. God kept saying in Genesis about the covenant, I'll bless you and everybody who bless you are blessed. So, not just God of creation, God of justice, God of love. The Old Testament writers call him over 280 times the, the God of covenant. But now, to enter into the covenant was not a simple business. It's very, very serious. The Hebrews talk about not making a covenant. Literally, they talk about cutting a covenant. When we enter into the covenant together, we are making a promise. And here's the way they did it. They took animals and literally cut them into, tear them apart in two parts, and they would lay out a half of the animal here, 
and the half of the animal here. Think about that. And then they would do called covenant walk. They walk in between the pieces of the animals. Half of the animal here, half of the animal here, and they walk in between these two pieces. And it was called covenant walk. And the symbolic meaning of this is, if I don't honor my covenant with you, what happened to these animals may be my fate. Get it? Would you show us the screen? Jeremiah 34 verse 18 says, The men who have violated my covenant, I will treat like the calf they cut in two, and then walk between its pieces. That's called covenant walk. When people cut a covenant, blood gets shed like this. When we cut the animal, blood will shed. And now, when somebody violated a covenant, it's not voided. But there will be a penalty like this torn, bloodshed animals. It simply means death. If you violate your covenant, our covenant, and you walk in between the animals, you violate it, and it simply means death, tragic death. This is the covenant God had made with the human race. Human race. And this is amazing. In Genesis 15, God has Abraham bring some animals to him, a ram, a god, a heifer, cuts them in two, sets the halves apart. And then what's really amazing in this, is, in this story is who it is that does the covenant walk. Who it is that took the covenant walk. Genesis 15, 17, you will find this one. A smoking fire pot with a blazing torture appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord cut a covenant with Abraham. Now in that day, the Old Testament, smoke and fire pot, smoke and fire symbolize the presence of God, which means God, not Abraham, God is taking the covenant walk. God humbles himself to take an oath. Abraham, I want so much for you to trust me. I will take the covenant walk if I don't keep my promise with you. If I don't keep my promise with you, it will be my fate. I will be torn like these animals and my blood will shed. It's amazing. There's no other God like this. Sacrifice himself. If the covenant between God and the human grace gets broken, if it's not honored, there's a promise, price that will, be, that will have to be paid like a torn animal. Who will pay it? There's a blood that will have to be shed. Who will shed? Somebody's going to be broken. Whose body will be broken? And God's forgiveness and salvation work for people and the world started in this way. From his sacrifice. We, did, we didn't do anything for our salvation. But God first cut the covenant and proclaimed that if our covenant is broken by either you or me, it doesn't matter. I'll tear my body apart. And shed my blood. It's pretty serious and pretty amazing. And the human being really broke the covenant. You and I broke the covenant. We all are sinners. In our deep hearts, there are sins that are incompatible with most holy, perfect, just, pure, righteous God. Even if it is a very tiny little sin, it is incompatible with God and we broke the covenant. Hatred, anger, violence, abuse, gossip, pride, lust, arrogance, stubbornness, hypocrisy, deceit, cheating, ignorance, something like that. I found a lot of times in my heart Something like this. The Bible says, take a look at the screen. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Next one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And what is the result of sin? See, Romans 3, 23. For, for the wages of sin is definitely death. We are all sinners who condemn to death. Every time we sin, 
Every time we violate the covenant and the relationship, relationship with God, the wage of sin is nothing but death. We are supposed to die. That's what the Bible says to us. We're trapped in death, and there is no way for us to get out of it. That's the human condition, the Bible says. So, the Jewish people have taken two goats, actually, on the Day of Atonement. They are still doing this uh, once a year, and it's called, uh, you know, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is the biggest day, most highest holy day in Israel. And they literally cut one of the God them in two. And the blood will be shed before all people. The Jewish culture is very visual. And then the chief priest takes the other God, the live God, and do this. See, Leviticus 16. Take a look at the screen. He laid both hands on the head of the live God and confessed over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the God's head. He shall send the God away in the desert and the care of a man appointed for the task. What does he do? He killed that. The God will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place. It's a scapegoat. Actually, scapegoat, the word came from this. All their sins, all their guilt, all their shame, big sins and tiny little hidden sins, all the sins of the old people loaded onto one God, scape God, and the unclean gods taking all the sins of the world where they go. They are taken into, taken out into the deep desert where they would be killed where they would be die. And on the day of atonement, everybody in Israel could say, I'm forgiven. I put my own sins on the God, and He was sacrificed instead of me, and I'm forgiven, I'm clean, I'm saved. Now I am a righteous man. Who broke the covenant? It's people. And who takes penalty? Goat and lamb. But of course, all these sins don't disappear. The goat is just a picture. A goat is just a reminder that we still need somebody who will pay the covenant walk. Then when your sins happen, who's going to pay for it? This is a pers personal question. Who is your, who is your real scapegoat? When you confess your sins, when your souls are broken by your guilt, who's going to take your sins? Who's going to pay the price that has to be paid for your forgiveness? Who loves you most? Who can do that? The Bible says, there was one man who has been torn and thrown out into desert like a goat for you. And for me. And see, here is the most wonderful, profound, deepest word in the Bible. It was told by John the Baptist when Jesus was coming to him for the first time, when he was coming to Jordan River to be baptized. You will see this one. Next one, please. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And after three years of his ministry, when it was time for Jesus to die, he went to Jerusalem to have a last supper, where he celebrated Passover with his friends. In a dinner, they remembered the blood of the Lamb should be shed to be sign of their deliverance. And at the table, Jesus poured out a cup of wine and he said, This is cup. This cup is the new covenant. And they all knew exactly what he was saying. There was an old covenant. God is the God of the covenant, and, but it never worked out. People couldn't keep it. We actually get it. We, could, we couldn't get it right. We violated. We broke it. God had cut a covenant with Abraham so long ago and had been shattered. It was wrapped in ruin. It wasn't God's first. The covenant was broken by us. 
if there was going to be a new covenant, somebody would have to pay. If there was going to be a new covenant, somebody would have to be broken. Somebody who did the covenant work between the broken sacrifice would have to be broken again and be sacrificed himself. And Jesus on the night with his friends around the table and said, this cup is the new covenant. And my blood, which is shed for you, this is the cup which is shed for you and for many. This cup is the new covenant. And the very next day, this man, Jesus, did the covenant work of sacrifice to a place called Calvary. And on the cross, the price that needed to be paid, the death that needed to be died, the sin that needed to be cleansed, the atonement that needed to be made was accomplished finally and fully by Jesus on the cross. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I believe everyone is sinners and the result of sins is nothing but death. Before the most holy, perfect God, everyone, everyone, However, God's grace and forgiveness was given to all of us through His sacrificial death on the cross because He paid it. He sacrificed instead of us. And the question for every human being, the question for you and me is this, now who will atone your sin and my sin? Who will pay for it? Who will die for you? There are two choices. We can say, I will. This is my life. I could cover my sins. I will pay my debt. That's one choice. But I want to ask you, how many good words are enough to save you? I want to ask you one again. How much money is enough to cleanse your sins? How much good words are enough to satisfy God? Are enough to override Death of Jesus on the cross. And the other choice you can say is this. Jesus, I want to receive your cross to cleanse my sin. I'd like to receive your forgiveness through your sacrificial death on the cross. I choose you. I surrender myself to you, O God. Receive me. You are the Lord of my life. You are the master of everything, even my burdens and sins, you all took my things on the cross. Thank you, God. I admire you. I honor you. No, I believe you. I trust you. You are. You are. I want to end with a story. A man named Max Dupree was a paramedic in World War II, and he served in Europe, and I've never forget this story about how they served, how they saved soldiers. They go into the field after battle as much as they could to try to save the soldiers there. Sometimes they would be wounded Allied soldiers and sometimes they would be wounded German soldiers. Max said, they always carried with them units of blood for transfusion and that blood would save their lives. And the bags of blood carried the names of the donors on the bags. So whoever got the blood could see the name and know whose blood would come into their bodies and save their lives. Max said, they started doing interesting things. It wasn't military policy. Just some of them started doing that. They would save some bags that had Jewish names on them for the German Nazi soldiers. Max said, they would tell them, I'm going to help you. You know you're going to die. Without this blood, you're going to die. But you can be saved. You can be saved. You don't have to die. But you will have to receive blood from a Jewish donor if you want to stay alive. 
and make sense. Some of them would say, yes, please, yes. I want to live. I want to go back home. I want to see my family. My, I, I want to see my children, my wife. They need me. I want to live. Give me, give me. And Max said, it was the most amazing thing. Sometimes they would say, no. They would say, I'd rather die. I'd rather die than humble myself to receive life from Jewish donor. Here's the message of the cross. We shared last week and last, last week about heaven and hell. And we confirm, we affirm that cross is the only way and only truth and only life. Even though, even if we respect other religions, other faiths, we fully honor the religions and we are still running from the other faiths, other religions. But we said, we share about that. The only way God offered to us is the cross. God is not willing that anyone should perish, but He gives to everyone a choice. God is giving you a choice, the most important one you can ever make. Who are you trusting you to atone your sin? Who are you trusting to set things right between you and God? Who are you trusting to make a new covenant in your life? Who are you trusting to save you, you or Jesus. Now, as we enter into 2013 Renton season, why don't we reaffirm our faith on the cross? This is the heart of the faith. This is the heart of the Christianity. And this is the heart of the church. God gave you the offer. God gave you the choice. You can decide right now. Let's pray. Gracious God, we love you and we appreciate, we really give thanks to you. You have made the covenant with us. You will bless us. You created us. You will bless my children. You bless my work, my study, and bless my life. You have made the covenant, but we broke the covenant. Oh God, we are supposed to die, but you die. And now, you are offering to us the cross. This is the only way and the truth and the life. And because of this cross, blood of cross of Jesus Christ, you will be saved. You will be alive. And you, you will come to me, the presence of me. Oh God, in this moment, I want to humble myself before you. I want to throw away my pride, my arrogance, my stubbornness before God. And my, I want to humble myself. And I want to say, I need you, God. I need your son, Jesus Christ, in my life. We love you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.